Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. I'm still Jerry Schubel uh, for a little longer. It, I'm still here, yes. It's a it's great, great pleasure to welcome my old dear friend, Sylvia Earle, to the Aquarium of the Pacific. Marine biologist, explorer, female chief scientist for NOAA, National Geographic explorer in residence, Time Magazine's hero of the planet, the first one ever in 1998. And she has been referred to by many as her deepness. And when she was at NOAA as the chief scientist, she was often called the Sturgeon General of NOAA. <laughs> and there are, she has many other endearing titles. I've known her for many decades. She is perhaps and probably the most constant, consistent, and compelling voice for the ocean that I have ever known. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sylvia Earle. Thank you, Jerry, for that generous introduction. I so wish that I had been here last night and missed out on what I understand was a vigorous Q&A. Let's hope that maybe we can get some good discussions going this evening as well. So, lots of, of conjecture about what to do with these structures that did not exist when I was a child. Offshore oil and gas exploration and recovery in the history of humans is a relatively new endeavor. When this photograph was taken 51 years ago by the young Bill Anders, who is still around, he's up there in Washington State, he has this photograph on his wall. I had a chance to visit him about this time last year. And he said they went to explore the moon. Apollo 8 was destined to go for the first time on a mission to see the far side of the moon. Big figure eights from Earth around the moon, Earth around the moon, and then... But he said that what we discovered was, was the Earth itself. We went to explore the moon, we found the Earth. This is it. And <laughs> the bottom line, it's blue, it's blue, it's mostly ocean. Somehow, in the last half century, the ocean has really begun to come into its own in terms of human understanding. We once thought that we could not harm the ocean. The ocean was the best place to put stuff, garbage, trash, toxic things that we did not want close to where we lived. We could deep six them in the ocean, things would simply go away. Now we know otherwise. We also thought we could take anything out of the ocean that we wish, that fish were infinite in their capacity to recover. Even in the 1960s, there were great plans to see how we can more vigorously, and they're still in motion, to take more from the ocean, exploit the living creatures that are there. Well, now we know what we could not know when a lot of policies were put into place, not just 50 years ago, but over the decades. We keep learning. Sometimes the policies that we make based on one belief or one set of knowledge, information, if you will, evidence, now we keep learning, keep discovering, keep finding out why the ocean matters, what we need to do, what we should maybe not be doing. With respect to offshore oil and gas extraction, well, for one thing, if we had not taken oil and gas out of the depths of the earth, whether it was from the land or the sea, that image would not be possible. We need to thank fossil fuels. Thank you, fossil fuels, for giving us the prosperity we now enjoy, the lights that we now um, take for granted. 
the transportation and certainly going to the moon. But now we know we have to think differently about the burning of fossil fuels, about the actions that once seemed like just the obvious right thing to do. If oil, gas are out there, down there, let's just go get it at whatever cost. The investment made in offshore oil and gas drilling to not just oil companies, but to all people, taxpayers, we have invested to make what we now think of as normal, our lifestyle, take, make, makes, makes it possible. But we also know that there are other possibilities. And that's the other gift that we have from fossil fuels, seeing other possibilities with the communications systems, the network of discovery that has been possible thanks to the energy provided over the last century or so, but especially in the last 50 years. So, okay, you just saw in that film some great images of what it has taken to go out in what would have seemed years ago to be impossible to develop these space platforms, like the space station up in the sky, except there are these sophisticated offshore setups where people live, eat, sleep, and work, and actually access, not just at the depth of the water, but beneath the bottom of the sea, going down considerable distance below the bottom of the sea. An engineering feat that is still, when you think about how remarkable it is from where we were 100 years ago to where we are today in terms of the technology that enables us to do things that once were regarded as just impossible, but it's, it's been done. And now, some of these systems that were put in place half a century ago or so have reached the end of their useful life not as structures, but for the purpose that they were established, that was the, the source of the oil or the gas that they were there to extract has diminished. Well, it is a non-renewable resource after all. You can take and take and take, but then it's gone. So then what do you do with this big expensive structure? Well, for quite a while, the idea has been you just got to get them out of there, take them away. But as a scientist who spent thousands of hours underwater, I've come to see some options, some other ways of thinking. I, uh, for example, see whales go by with a load of creatures either on them or around them, barnacles on humpback whales, the beloved gray whales that cruise up and down the coast of California. They're just plastered with barnacles and little critters that grow on their hides. You know, there's so many creatures that like to live on a, on a something, on a reef, on a whale, on a rock. How do I do this? There. <laughs> The roots of a mangrove tree. It, not just the mangrove that you see there. This is a, a, a metropolis of life, all attracted to a surface, something to hang on to. And then other things grow on top. And then other things grow on top of those other things. And a, a little system is created. It's not just the mangrove. It's a mangrove plus sponges and corals and seaweeds and bryozoans, and polychaete worms, and you name it, it just goes on and on. You get a list of dozens of creatures, kinds of creatures. Where do I point? There we go. <laughs> and you see it in oceans of today with stuff that is in the sea that we have put there. Wait, let me go back. This is called a fish aggregating devices. <laughs> Fishermen put, deliberately put stuff in the ocean to attract fish. 
And why do they get attracted? Well, partly it's shelter, but it's also there are things growing on stuff that's put into the sea. It's amazing. Again, a lot of this did not exist, but there have always been logs, there have always been things floating around in the ocean that illustrate this principle of life aggregating around surfaces. So anybody who owns a boat, even a little boat, let alone a big boat, knows you've got to be careful and keep scraping the bottom because stuff grows on the, anything you put in the water. You know, it's the ocean is alive. It's alive. I mean, and so many creatures, I don't know why that goes back. Sorry. I can drive submarines, but I'm having a hard time <laughs> with this little device. <laughs> I'll get it in a minute. All right. So sometimes ships don't stay on the surface. They sink, and then guess what? They become attractors. They become, and sometimes deliberately, ships are actually decommissioned and dropped into the ocean to become, ta-da, artificial reefs. This is not the case in this particular ship. It's in Truck Lagoon, where warships in 1994, um, dozens of them, airplanes too, were downed in a few days. They serve like time capsules in terms of knowing the growth rates, at least the minimum size that one uh, coral can get in a period of time, because you know exactly when the ship went down. And that's being done experimentally with some of the ships that are deliberately decommissioned and used as a place to attract life into the sea, a home for fish, if you will. And these next few images show little pieces of this sunken fleet in Truck Lagoon, where, you know, if you didn't know better, you'd say that's just a piece of an artificial, I mean, a real reef. So I've spent time living underwater, 10 times overall, most recently in this structure, the Aquarius Underwater Laboratory. It only sits in 20 meters of water, but it didn't take long before this squeaky clean surface became a garden. And when they finally had to take it out at one point, a lot of fish were really unhappy <laughs> because there was their, you know, home, and not to mention the corals and sponges and all the little guys that were plastered like a garden growing on the outside. It just happens. It's the nature of life in the sea. I don't think that unless you actually get out there, down there, or if you own a boat, you can appreciate how effective structures in the sea, whether it's a regular, I mean, a natural reef or a pier, or a sunken ship, or whatever, becomes a safe haven, a home, a habitat, if you will. These little fish were gathered together under the Aquarius underwater lab. They're always there. That was home for them. Also true with giant grouper and legions of little grunts. And, you know, if these fish could speak and give us their point of view, we, we should listen. We should listen. We should look and understand what is actually going on to what has been put into the ocean as well as what naturally occurs there in terms of structures. Oil rigs. Well, they're rigs and they're rigs. No two are exactly alike. That's a given. They, live, they are in various depths from a, a few hundred feet to more than a thousand feet. I got to know this rig in the Gulf of Mexico fairly well over a period of years, working with some of my pals at Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, at the Heart Research Institute. We'd go out there for excursions to check up on things. You know, these look like they might be roots of a mangrove tree, except they're really big, but they also are covered with life. But as a scientist, I see an opportunity with these structures that were not put there for scientific purposes, 
But like those reefs, those ships that were sunk in Truck Lagoon, they're time capsules. You know exactly when the rig went in. You can get some idea of how much of what diversity of life can accumulate in a known period of time. And the term vertical transect, from the surface down to as deep as the legs of the platform go, you have a built-in scientific experiment based on what are the surface water conditions, temperature-wise, salinity-wise, light-wise. You can get from the sunlit surface down to the twilight zone and beyond, where it's completely dark all of the time. And some scientists, and I'm one of them, would just oh, love to have a laboratory where you could have instruments at sea, just monitoring the conditions out there. Well, it costs a lot of money to do that. But here are some existing platforms that could be transmogrified, as they say, into something, a different life, a different purpose. Of course, I understand C cost. And yes, I understand things like liability, insurance, who's going to pay. But there are lots of reasons you could conjure up to think, well, those reefs have been there, those rigs have been there for a long time. They were never intended to be purposeful for science. They were never intended to be habitats for fish and other creatures. Let's just get rid of them. Most of that thinking has been generated before knowing what we now know and largely not knowing what it's actually like down there. Who has interviewed the fish or the other creatures to get their perspective? Well, I've done my best. Bottom line is, no two reefs are the same, but everyone should be looked at with the potential for what they could be now that they've finished their useful life as rigs. Might there be potential as laboratories, as monitoring stations, as sanctuaries, as built-in safe havens for the creatures who are attracted there, it's their nature to do so, to go where the action is, where creatures have set up housekeeping, generating food, creatures from some distance away stop by and take advantage of the groceries that are right there for them to enjoy. So, just a few more images of this reef, this rig, this scientifically um, useful platform that unfortunately no longer exists. It was taken out following the rules that were made some time ago. And a lot of people, including the divers who got to know the fish who lived there and those who visited there, because it is or was an opportunity. And I think in the situation that we're sort of grappling with here in California, we're only talking 27 reefs, but there are 27 opportunities that might be looked at with a view toward, okay, maybe some of them are places that we should actually totally get rid of them. And others that maybe their purpose could be something more than just a derelict piece of junk out there. I think the time has come to reconsider what's on the books, reconsider the numbers, reconsider the questions that people have for just being negative about them, and think about the positive pluses. The ocean, we know, globally, is in trouble. True here in California, as it is all over the world. 
what can be done to help put things that have been lost, give them a break. We plant trees to help restore forests. In a sense, although we did not intend for these rigs to be habitats for creatures, in fact, that's what they have become. And there is evidence, I think those of you who were here yesterday and some presentations today, pointing out how, because most of the ocean is open for exploitation. California has taken a leadership role in terms of both four large marine sanctuaries where, although they're called sanctuaries, fishing continues throughout most of those areas. And we do have a network of really fully protected areas, but relative to the areas that are open for exploitation, they're rather small but they are safe havens. Can you imagine the possibility that these rigs could be, well, like what they say in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a steel archipelago out there, islands, that are safe havens, like it or not. They are not just fish attractors, they are fish multipliers, given that they are a safe haven a safe zone where reproduction can take place and spill into adjacent areas. But it isn't just the fish. It's all of this, this cornucopia of life that gathers on surfaces. I mean, boat owners cringe when you think about this <laughs> cornucopia of life. They think it's just, uh, you know, got to get rid of that stuff that grows on the boat's bottom. But we have a chance, armed with knowledge that now exists, that did not and could not exist before right about now, to evaluate what we have here in California as maybe an opportunity not to be passed by. Lots of questions, and I really look forward to a discussion and hearing from you what your thoughts are, pro and con, and to hope that without pointing fingers or one point of view or another, that we might agree to move toward evaluating the potential. Maybe at the end, the ideas that were put forward will result in saying, ah, all things considered, we just ought to get rid of them. But we ought to give the idea that these could be safe havens, restoration areas, opportunities not to be passed by. Some of you know that I am started an organization called Mission Blue 10 years ago, developing a network of hope spots around the world, mostly areas that are in pretty good condition, that communities and champions are standing up to say, we care, we will do what we can to protect these areas. Some areas are not in great shape. One of them, for example, San Francisco Bay is a hope spot with champions and a community trying to go from where San Francisco Bay is to get to a better place. It's a hope spot. There are other places that already are in pretty great shape, like Palau, the whole country, the waters around Palau, where 80% of the entire exclusive economic zone has been declared a safe haven for the creatures who live there. I mean, even the lobsters are safe. What a concept. Imagine, just imagine, the possibility of some of these, quotes, artificial reefs, artificial islands, these rigs might be adopted by a champion, by a community, to say, we're going to see what we can do to use this as a centerpiece, a hope spot, if you will. Now, there aren't any oil rigs so far as hope spots in all the world. I think there are 120 plus. All of them are grounded in something other than an artificial reef. But I'm just throwing it out there 
as an idea, a possibility. I want to end my images and shift to a little video that was prepared by a young woman and her colleagues, a friend of mine, has the unlikely name of Amber Sparks. She's a biologist. She's been working at Scripps with her colleagues. We can just let that film run. She prepared this for you, for this occasion. And I'm thrilled to be able to share the images that they have gathered just to provide the perspective of the creatures who actually have adopted these rigs as home. When I look at these amazing engineering structures, and I've had an opportunity to visit these rigs of various sorts um, in the Gulf of Mexico, in the North Sea, in China. I mean, they're all over the world. Maybe here in California, so forward thinking in so many ways, some creative ideas might be put forward. So how could this investment, I mean, we're talking billions of dollars have been invested in these offshore platforms. It just seems like such a waste to scrap them when there is a potential for possibly a new life, a new purpose. It's not going to happen all by itself. It's going to happen because people see the potential and voice their concerns and are willing to see if the current policy, which is really aimed at let's just get rid of those nasty old reefs, to thinking about well, maybe that works for some of them, maybe it works for all of them, but shouldn't we consider the huge investment that's been made? And maybe there are some creative alternatives. Maybe there's some private funding that could be brought to bear to make these really elegant research platforms, like a research vessel. It's sitting out there. It doesn't move around. It's stationary. But there's a place for stations in the sea, just as there are weather stations on the land. It can be consistent monitoring, not just above, but also in the depths below. I've heard proposals over the years <laughs> from many sources about converting not just rigs to reef, but rigs to laboratories, rigs to monitoring stations, and in some cases, it has happened. We should look elsewhere for what has worked, where people have really taken advantage of these amazing structures and have repurposed them. It hasn't happened very often. Why? Because it's a matter of money, it's a matter of risk, it's a matter of responsibility. Lots of reasons why you could say, no, we can't do that. But there are also a lot of reasons that we ought to look at about why we should consider the alternatives. Now, to get to the bottom of some of these rigs, you can't go as a scuba diver. You need a remotely operated vehicle or a submarine. I think that's terrific. Let's do it. Why not take advantage of the technologies that currently exist to use these as sites that have a, a true value in terms of a time capsule of what's there, what has what accumulated over the decades. What kinds of communities live at different levels of light and warmth or cold? Even having a chance to easily go back to the same exact place time and time again, to clear a space, as I have done in a number of situations with the Chuck Lagoon um, <laughs> ships, to see how fast recovery takes place. If you removed a piece of the action at any section, 
How long does it take for the sponges to reform around a place? Growth rates from a known source, places you can go back to, where you can leave instruments and be pretty sure they're not going to be drifting off somewhere. You've got a secure place to leave them. Well, sea lions might run off with them. I just wish those who had made the judgment call years ago about the only good derelict reef is one that's taken out of the ocean, to take them down to see what the sea lions see, to really ask the fish, what do you think? To ask a scientist, is there value here? Would the value of a new life for these rigs excel or exceed the value of one that is just taken apart and trashed? Huh. Ask the anemones. I'm told that some of the largest, most intact I mean, not large in terms of populations, but also largest rockfish in California actually hang out under these reefs, the rigs that look like reefs. Why? Well, there they have a safe haven. Fishermen, generally speaking, don't risk their nets or their lines in the deep sea around the base where these creatures hang out. given the population decline of not just rockfish, but many species that could have a chance to recover if the place that they have adopted as a home were left in place. Good news for the surrounding area of restoring what has been taken or lost. I should just ask, how many of you have ever dived on a rig? Ah, yay. So, it's, the choir is out there. <laughs> so, Jerry, what do you think? I think we might have a conversation and engage the, the, the brilliant people who are sitting here. Pardon? So let's come over here, Sylvia. You can let you let them roll if you want to. Well, Sylvia, you always, as always were worth waiting for, yeah. and I think you. <laughs> You've given us some very good advice, which I hope we will follow, and that is that we should consider these 27 platforms as opportunities. In an uncertain world, it's always a good idea to keep ideas and options in play, and, and that's really what, what we should do. And you, you talked about using these platforms as exploration. You, one usually thinks of exploration as exploring unknown or unexplored places. But taking specific places and exploring them over time tells us an awful lot about the ocean. We're going to take questions from our audience. If you raise your hand, we will bring a microphone to you. Anybody? We have one over here. Hi, thank you, Dr. Earl, for, uh, for, for coming. Um, oh, it, it, it's working. I just have to project a little bit. Um, th thank you so much um, for, for, for coming here. I think uh, my, that sentiment is uh, echoed throughout this entire room. I'm really hoping that you would discuss Hope Spots um, a little bit more, um, especially with respect to um, these really amazing places that are very close to us offshore here. But I'm just curious, um, 
really what, what, the, what the difference is, the fundamental difference is between a hope spot and a marine protected area, or is, is there any difference? Hope spots are sometimes protected, but many of them are on their way toward that goal. They start, yet a protected area has to start somewhere. Somebody has to do something that will move to where you are to get to a better place. And even places that are designated for protection aren't always protected. <laughs> like our marine sanctuaries, for example. I love them, but even President Bush, when he declared the Papahanamakua Kea Marine Reserve, questioned, well, why do you call them sanctuaries if you can go fishing there? <laughs> and he likes to fish. But he could see the, the strange attitude we have. It's OK to, you don't kill the birds in a national forest, but it's OK to kill the fish in a national marine sanctuary. So that was, it just hadn't occurred to him or to a lot of people, people who think that the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is protected for fish, lobsters, sea cucumbers, and all the life that's there. No, it started out with only 3%, and then it was 6%. They doubled it, 6%. And now it's about close to 30%, but it's uh, still not what you would call a park in the same sense that we think of as a park on the land, where, well, even on the land, not all wildlife has been uniformly protected, like wolves and bears and things. But anyway, the idea with Hope Spots is to have individuals nominate a place that they have identified that they care about. And they send in um, a request, get an application form, answer the questions like, why this place? Who are you? What are you going to do? <laughs> what are the needs? What are the special things about this place? Anyway, th there's a list of questions. And when they fill out the application, it goes to uh, the, an IUCN advisory council of volunteer scientists who review the applications and, and usually Either they whoosh, go right through as, yes, this is ready to go, or make recommendations about how to strengthen uh, an application. But it, it's somebody, a champion, has to step up. And it typically involves a community. And with a community, I don't mean just a handful of individuals. I mean universities, um, research institutions, whatever. It can be a small area, it can be a really large area, like Palau. Uh, but uh, together, they form this network of hope. We're working with ESRI, the organization that does global information system layering. You know, you have the ability to take data of various sorts, characterize an area with their story, um, was it story? Story maps. Story maps. Story maps. Right. So one of the things that champions commit to is gather data, or the community does, or there may be existing databases. The, one of the most recent hope spots was the Gulf Coast of Florida. It's an area that runs from the Florida Keys up to Pensacola, and it embraces a number of institutions, such as the Moat Marine Laboratory, Florida State University, University of South Florida, but also involves a lot of kids. And the champion, the key champion who brought this together, is not a scientist, but he's a very astute and caring naturalist and photographer. And he just said, we've got to do something to knit the community together here. And so by making it a hope spot and taking the databases that already exist using the Esri platform, that's, that's the way that we're aiming to go from where we are to get to a better place. And as you say, even with areas that on paper have protection, we can strengthen that if we get people to say, 
you know, you say it's a protected area, but we can do better than that. But you need the evidence. And so these individuals, they're volunteers, really, for the most part, just saying we're doing what we can to turn things from where it, they are to get to a new level. We have a question over here. First of all, Happy New Year. And thanks to the people in this room, it looks like it's going to be a very good New Year. Um, I have kind of a, it's kind of a technical question in a way. These oil rigs are metal structures put in salt water. The areas above the, the, the mean water line, of course, can be maintained like any metal structure. Then you've got the tidal zone. And then as you go down and you get this wonderful reef-like effect on these metal structures, does that protect the metal structure from future deterioration? Or is there a way to monitor that? Because eventually, if these things collapse, they'd still be marine sanctuaries. <laughs> and as long as there's no life hazard up above, that's not the worst end of the world. But I could never, ever really see taking the lower structures out. I, I know they've topped some of them to take them below the, the shipping level, you know, so it's safe for ships to pass over the top. But I can't imagine taking out the lower regions. But I just wondered if there's been any metallurgical uh, studies on the, the effects of the marine growth on metal in salt water. Well, if you're in the place above water, you'd certainly want to have an answer to that question. How durable <laughs> are these structures that are holding us up? And certainly, over the years, the oil companies who've made the investment have developed technologies to have sensors and they, they have devices to, um, what are they called? To, the, uh, you do it with ships as well to... To find protection systems. Yeah, right. And to, to avoid the deterioration or at least to, <laughs> to slow it down. But um, all that, to me, when you look at these amazing investments to support people, I mean, ships are not always a gift. You, you have the maintenance. If, if you have a ship, you have to take care of it. The same is true with these rigs. You have to maintain them if you're going to use them, or not. If they get cut off, they're just left there like an artificial reef, if you will. But I see, again, every Everyone should be, of the 27 that are out there still standing, don't, they, don't, we, don't we owe it to ourselves to evaluate them individually and say, you know, this one, really, really too much to handle. There isn't financially a way to, to, to take it, this as a, as a plus. We need to consider offing the rig. <laughs> but maybe you can find a champion to adopt the rig too. And the way you, there are champions for research vessels, private money as well as taxpayer money. Or maybe a case could be made that it has a value as a monitoring station. How much does a weather station cost? Here's a built-in opportunity to not just above water, but let's look at the nature of what is below. How much does a, a buoy cost that is anchored that is a monitoring station out in the ocean. Here we have an anchored station already in place. Shouldn't we at least consider the upside as well as the, the obvious negative side? Other question right over here. First of all, thank you. There, you'll have a microphone. Uh, Dr. Earl, uh, Dr. Schubel, I'm really inspired by tonight's presentations. Thank you so much. Uh, but it, it brings to me in mind that the public, the greater public out there, they're not in this room. This is a very select audience. There's a story that you tell when you describe your experiences and your exploration, but you as the explorer and residents of National Geographic, there's an opportunity at a, as an impartial storyteller, National Geographic is considered one of those, that could be a venue to tell the story of the exploration and the possibilities of these opportunities to a larger audience, to the public. 
because the political will for what's happening in California isn't there in terms of really giving these the fair due consideration that that's warranted. And the way to perhaps move that forward is get a group like National Geographic to take and get divers, experts like your, you as an explorer and those that you work with, to go and tell the story, not with a conclusion, but with an opening a question of opportunity that the public could get more engaged rather than learning about it in some story in a, or a scientific publication, which is not going to reach many people. But it seems like there's a, there's a special opportunity. I'm astonished when I look at these images of what's there and what the possibilities are. But a storyteller like yourself, like both of you, are master storytellers. And that's, I think, what's, what's warranted in this case. Well, yes. <laughs> I think, in fact, you're going to show us a little. Well, after, when after this, we'll show the, the aquarium film. It's not about these platforms, but it's about opportunities and right. looking at the ocean through a different lens. Right. Well, that's, that's part of the problem. It's looking at the ocean with new eyes. We've always, throughout our entire history, the ocean has been a place that we dump things we don't want <laughs> close to where we are. Or it's a place to take things. And, and I am of two minds with a current trend toward what is generally being referred to as the blue economy. Because there's a strong stripe of, let's see how we can further exploit the ocean. What more can we take from the ocean? What are we missing, like manganese nodules? Let's go get them. Uh, I think we have to think differently about what we're already taking from the ocean. The most important thing is our existence. None of the rest matters if we, aren't, if we can't breathe <laughs> or if the ocean gets further degraded. The under, well, what? We, we just take for granted a planet that works in our favor. At least we used to. But now, because we haven't been paying attention, we've disrupted climate, weather. We have reduced, well, huh, scrambled life in the ocean and on the land in a way that, in such a short time, unraveled systems that have been hundreds of millions of years in the making with consequences that we've only begun to think about the consequences. And maybe it's only right now we have the technology that enables us to evaluate what we've done and to project the consequences and maybe to give us some guidance about what we can do to stabilize and recover what we've lost. When I look at the appetite that we've developed for tuna, for example, I mean, it's not just one species, but let's just take bluefin. In the Pacific Ocean, in 50 years, their numbers have declined, according to Barbara Block to, uh, at Stanford, who makes it her business to look at bluefin, down to like less than 3% of what there were. What does that do, not just to tuna, but to the whole system of which they were a major part, like wolves on the land. When we took them out of the system, what were the consequences? We didn't think about it. See a wolf, kill the wolf, bad, bad wolf. <laughs> With the fish, it's the other way around. It's mm, delicious. <laughs> eat fish, see fish, eat fish. But now we have to think about the other values that they contribute to the ocean that we d haven't thought about in the past. That doesn't mean we're going to stop eating fish, but maybe we'll be more judicious about how many of what kind and how we take them, where we take them, and be more respectful of what they give us in terms of more than just pounds of meat. And, but I, with the blue economy, it's reframing the relationship of people with the ocean. Yes. It isn't just about exploitation. It's about conserving sustainable uses and, in, in some cases, rebuilding. So if it's, when it's framed properly, yep. I, I think it might it could, has the possibility of changing the game. It's a worthy concept. I've, had, I've been a part of so many discussions that ultimately kind of lead toward, well, how much more can we uh, take out of the ocean? 
I think it's really important that we think in terms of giving back. We've taken so much for so long without really accounting for the cost. Fish are free, right? Actually, the oil and gas, we don't pay the real price. I mean, give me 100 million years and maybe we can restore what we've taken, but we just think it's there, let's go for it. And it's okay within a certain framework, but when we've, we've exceeded so many of the limits of what is, quote, sustainable, what can be renewed. And I would agree with you. I think that's why we have to re reset the, the whole system. Who has another one? Over here, Jerry. Over here. <laughs> okay. So, hi. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to ask this. This is something I've actually been thinking about since 2015 when I was in seventh grade. Um, these structures have a wonderful opportunity to a room full of scientists, environmentalists, and activists to try and uh, help the environment. But in order to be able to get more and more people onto it, we also have to show the human side of how does this benefit us. And a way in how I was being able to think of this is by trying to help the private sector get more motivation to get into it. So not only can we um, turn these structures into a research vessel, what I thought was after you got most of the uh, oil distillery uh, equipment, you can turn it also into an aquaculture farm that's attached to the vessel as well as a research vessel for all these environments. I don't know if this is possible, but I would like to ask two experts on how uh, affordable and how uh, possible this opportunity would be. Jerry, you might comment on that. I think you, that the idea of making an existing platform the centerpiece of, because it's a structure in place that's pretty solidly there, that maybe it could be a starting point at least for some smart aquaculture. A lot of the aquaculture that, that I have seen proposals for is not what I would call smart, trying to raise carnivores or trying to, I don't know, it, it, there, there's some issues, but in fact, there was some time that, that of Santa Barbara that mussels were being taken from, they're actually being used as <laughs> a de facto aquaculture setups because they're, so, they're such good um, places for the mussels to set up housekeeping that some people were actually extracting them and selling them. I don't know how that but anyway, I would agree. There's been a lot of uh, aquaculture that has not been smart aquaculture, but I think in this country we have a lot of the knowledge. The, many of the issues relate to siting. Where do you site these farms? Yep. And then how, where do you, how do you stock them? What do you stock them with? How many fish? And then what, how do you feed them? Right. And we've done a, made a lot of advancements in turning carnivores into omnivores and even into vegetarians like you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there, there's hope. And there is. We, if we do this incrementally and see how we're doing and, and monitor and research them, and around these platforms there are restricted areas. So you could have cages, you could have laboratories. It's worth an experiment that is reversible if it all goes wrong. But yeah. this, this country imports 91% of its seafood by, by value. Sea life. Sea life, sea, sea life <laughs> all right, we've turned into food. But sea life, by value, most of it comes from Asia. And when you think of the environmental footprint that's associated with that, it's large. Most of, plants. It is, <laughs> most of it is harvested under unknown environmental and human rights conditions. And uh, that's right. so it's, it's another one of these opportunities that we should look at. Yeah. Let's, we have another one. Yes, we got a lot of them. Uh, hi, Dr. Earl. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming, and I commend you for your wonderful comments on these bastions of biodiversity that, that we're looking at. Um, since uh, I want to digress a little bit, and since you brought up the subject of manganese nodules, I'm wondering if you could comment on your opinion of the deep sea mining in the clarion Clipperton zone and what your thoughts are on the potential damage um, and for, to biodiversity in those deep sea areas when that gets underway. If you have an opinion on that, I'd really like to hear it. Thank you. If I understand 
question that was about the biodiversity associated with deep sea mining and, and correct in, in the hello right. in the Clary and Clipperton zone mining of manganese nodules in the Clarion Clipperton zone. What, what's your assessment of that? Yes. Well, it seems to me we're doing it all over again in terms of not understanding the real value of what's there. Just looking superficially at a short-term identified market for metals that are contained within these living lumps. They're, the manganese nodules are a mix of minerals, metals, but they're deposited by microbes, bacteria. They're living rocks, if you will. They aren't just dead stones. They're alive. And it's not just the rocks. It's the communities of life associated with them and under them. I mean, where there's water, there's life. And, and the ocean in the deep sea is the, it's probably the least explored part of the planet. What we know is there are metals within the nodules that have a market value now for batteries, for the things that we now value, and rare earth minerals are also there. Oh, I just shake my head in, in despair almost that we would consider without really knowing the carbon cycle, without really understanding the processes that are taking place, in, that we would think of just bulldozing the ocean floor for what we perceive as a short-term market for some say it's a need. Well, I, I can't see it. I see that on the land, although there are problems with mining everywhere that mining does take place, um, those are more readily addressed if they're where people are than in the deep sea where people are not, where people can't complain about <laughs> what's happening down there. The experimental mining that's taken place creates enormous plumes, disrupts these processes that take, you know, may take, hmm, what, how long for a mangrove forest to recover if you cut it down, to replant or let it grow? I don't know, centuries maybe. But for manganese nodules, a million years for a fist-sized lump. And we, again, it's, it's, it's just our, our value system seems off base. And, and why do we think these are, quotes, necessary? I, I, I'm baffled. I mean, I, I go back to the 1980s when there was a, a great surge of interest in deep sea mining. And then it kind of faded away as people came to grips with the reality of the cost associated with getting down to the deep sea 20,000 feet or so, and then bringing the metals back up to the surface. The same problems still exist, but what we haven't put on the balance sheet is the cost to things we can't recover. The systems that are lost, the, the octopus garden where <laughs> the species of octopus seems associated with the manganese nodules and that's where they gather together to have a hoop it up and do whatever it takes to have baby octopuses. Ask me, I don't know why they do that, but there's so many questions we haven't even, we don't know enough to ask the right questions. All we ask is, can we go get them? Can it be cost effective in terms of the way we evaluate cost? Not what we're losing at the same time. So, okay, short answer. I say a moratorium, please. 10 years at least, until we have an opportunity to seriously consider, to the best of our current ability, the trade-offs. What, what are we losing as well as what are we gaining? Right now, it's just a matter of 
of, of what, what can we take out, not what are, what are we leaving, what are, what's the cost to the world we live in? So I, and I, I agree with you on, on all of that. These rare earths and the metals, though, they are very limited in their distribution on the earth. Right now, the only place they are where they're mineable is in China. Our, and us being able to get those depends upon our relationships with China. And I think that um, you, these are required for solar panels. They're required for all of our modern media, our cell phones, et cetera. What bothers me more, right now, 50% of the federal budget goes to funding medical research. That means only 50% goes to chemistry, physics, engineering, astronomy. All of these, and it's in those basic disciplines where the advances are made, we either have to increase the federal budget or adjust the balance because we're, we're losing the game in the United States. Well, two things on this, Jerry, and all of you, maybe some gurus in this audience who can offer some insight, but I understand that rare earths are not so rare. It's just costly to get them from where they are into a place, into a state that we can deal with, that the environmental constraints in China are not as <laughs> great as they are in some other places and labor costs, etc. that the reason that we look to China is because cost effective as we measure cost. But it's not that the specific metals, minerals involved are that rare. But the other fact is that there are batteries I love, I just glued to the new information that keeps coming out about alternative ways of storing energy. Different, you know, with lithium, nickel, cadmium, you know, lead, lead acid, old tried and true. But there are new materials, even carbon, lots of, of ways that are now, again, to your point, let's look at chemistry, let's look at physics, let's, and, it's not always with government support that this is happening. It's individuals, it's the entrepreneurs, it's the private sector that is probably making some real and exciting advances. So we don't need lithium anymore, but we've just squandered, you know, hundreds of square miles of ocean floor that we can't recover for other reasons that are maybe on the balance sheet more important than the short-term value that we have for this handful of, of metals. But they're rare not in that they're found only in a few places. They're rare in terms of being in concentrations that are readily recoverable. Yeah. But I think we better move on. Who has the next question? Who has the microscope? Yes. Um, hi, Dr. Earl. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, I am a budding researcher, I'm a current graduate student, and it's becoming the new normal for all of us to wear these many hats where we have to learn to become a researcher to our best ability, but we also need to learn scientific communication to appropriately bridge those gaps between us and the community. But I find it sometimes difficult when I'm out of the water to keep that positive outlook when there are so many negative things that come flooding through with the news and the timeline of our change in the climate and seeing the world underwater and getting that privilege, it makes me very hopeful to try to defend it and you know, move forward with protecting it. But my question to you is, you deal with a lot of different people that have varying perspectives on these topics. How do you maintain a positive and hopeful outlook through, uh, throughout your work? Thank you. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> it's people, you, asking questions that weren't being asked 50 years ago. How do we face the, what now is clear to a very um, wide audience, not just a handful, that 
human actions are altering the basic nature of nature, that we have the capacity to change the way the world works. We've done it. We've done it by damming rivers. We've done it by clear-cutting forests wholesale. We've done it by poisoning the planet in ways that seemed at the time to be a good thing. Now we have a chance to rethink, but we still have to, we, we have what we've inherited from the ignorance and the decisions made in ignorance or sometimes greed or whatever. Um, it's worrisome thinking about the plastics that now are all around us. In the beer you drink, the air you breathe. <laughs> the water too, not just the beer. <laughs> but it's um, something that now we know. That's cause for hope. Imagine if we didn't know. Imagine if we just didn't worry about the consequences to deep sea mining. Or, it's okay if we take the last tuna fish, so what? <laughs> or cut the last redwood, so what? We have a constituency of people, enough perhaps, to be asking the questions to use their, not just their power, the thing that is different about now as compared to when I was a kid is we all have superpower. We all know what could not be known before. And we also have the capacity to connect with others and build momentum that really takes your superpower and elevates it when you connect with somebody else who thinks the same way. And you get a movement underway that could not have happened not so long ago. We, we have much of the knowledge and the technology to create a much better world, as you point out. It takes creativity, it takes innovation, open minds, and we have to be willing to, to try some things, uh, to do some experimentation, but do it carefully so that it begins to go wrong. There Stop. are off, off, off ramps. Yeah, right. to re yeah, part of the problem with what you're facing here with the rigs issue, we're facing with fishing, we're facing with the dealing with plastics, we're facing in rules and regulations that were made at a time when we did not know what we now know. And we haven't gone back and edited, <laughs> re re given a chance to rethink what seemed like a good idea, a good policy, a good law at the time. We're stuck with it's legal to take more fish than the ocean can possibly provide. It's legal, but it's not right. Now that we know what we know, we ought to go back and say, well, wait a minute. And we are doing that, but we're doing it <laughs> too slowly. We need to really and we heard several times today and last night from Betty Yee that these decisions have to be made on the best available science. Right. And then and science changes. And science then, moves on and laws stay back here right. somewhere, or policies. Now, or even in the way people think, they haven't caught up. Scientists are notoriously not good communicators. <laughs> right. Now, we're going, to we're going to move off to the side and continue to take your questions. But Chris, I want you to set this so that we will be able to show you the film and still get you in your uh, vehicle to get you to LAX to fly overnight to Washington. So, who has the next question? We're going to walk over here, Sylvia. Okay. Right. right here. Who has the next right one? Right here. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Earl. Once again, I want to thank you for being here. Um, when I sat down tonight, I saw you walk out, and in front of me there she was a, a young scientist, 11 years old, whose jaw hit the floor. And so me, older, had the same reaction, and so I'm, I'm hoping that I can kind of pick your brain and ask for a personal story as someone who is a champion in science communication. You've inspired so many others. I was hoping you'd share an inspiring story of yours, uh, especially diving a rig or a, uh, an artificial reef was there any like wow, shocking moment that in all of your years of experience has really stood out to you? You got a so, wow story to tell us? <laughs> and you're growing up in New Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> Just well, being able to grow up in New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, people say, 
Well, I tell people sometimes that I come from a different planet. And they say, yeah, well, we knew that. <laughs> but really, New Jersey, when I was a kid, it was a different planet. And the ah, things that we see on the washed ashore today um, were just, they didn't exist. So I had a wilderness to explore when I would before I was 12 years old, and then my parents moved to Florida already, that Florida in the 40s and 50s had been transformed significantly, but still, it was wild. And I, I think that it's still there. The, and anyone with a face mask and fins can dive into the history of life on Earth. And even in a place that's been transformed, like, you know, go out to a, a dock and see who's living there, you see creatures who were around at the time before, or preceded dinosaurs, they're still there. Little hydroids, anemones, crabs. If you look at them with respect and, and with the knowledge that we now have, I mean, each one of these little creatures is a miracle. And if you can just capture that, kids know. They see these, whether it's an earthworm or a pill bug or a little fish, you know, they just see with a sense of wonder that we should keep. And I think I was blessed to have parents who didn't scrub it out of me when I was at an early age. So it's still there. I still look at the ocean like a little kid. And you've given us all lots of wow stories over the years, and I think you're right. It's keeping that childlike curiosity yeah. that's important. We're going to take one more, and then we're going to show you our films. Sorry? Okay, go ahead. Val. Thank you for the hope, Dr. Earl. Now, what I want to know is, what is the pathway? There are so many innovations that can be done on these oil rigs but we have to convince somebody. Is it the state? Is it the federal government? Is it the general public or all three? Right. Well, the first person you have to convince is the one you see in the mirror, you know, and figure out what is it that you have that is kind of special. That I have a daughter who has a good voice and she writes music, and she uses her voice, and she writes about things she cares about. That's her gift, if you will. Um, I have a grandson who's just going to be a scientist. He just is going to be. He has got the head for numbers and doesn't mind getting wet. <laughs> In fact, he loves getting wet, so do I. <laughs> and, you know, everybody has something that makes you, you. And there aren't any other yous in you know, we know this, everybody's different. And everybody has something to, that, that makes, that can make a difference. It doesn't have to be like coming up with a new kind of battery. It can be like the kid in Texas, Linda Marinas, who just saw trash on the beach and she couldn't walk by it without stopping and picking it up. And pretty soon people started following her and the great cleanup in Texas that now became the center of marine conservation's, you know, beach cleanup. It probably would have happened eventually anyway, because Linda Marinas was not the only one who, but she did something about it. And so it's look at yourself and do you write? Do you have a way with words? Do you have a way with kids? Whatever it takes, do something that will make a difference. And you th might think it's a little thing, but it's amazing how little things can grow into really big things based and on somebody who picks up on it and runs with it. Texas has the best litter motto of any state. Don't mess with Texas. <laughs> and it works. We're going to take, take one more. And to keep you so you don't miss your plane, uh, we're going to want you to give a fairly short answer. Please, Sylvia. OK, Dr. Earl, before you leave Hollywood, would you consider hosting an underwater TV show converting a rig 
into a reef. Why not? <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a good answer. All right, let's, let's play the film. <laughs>